Uh, Dennis Larson's a former Elm High School teacher and author and historian who's one of the top speakers on that YouTube list with his research and stories, especially about Ezra Meeker, but he's had other good topics here too. He recently spoke at the Lacey Museum's History Talk series about Natchez Pass, which is also found on YouTube. And secondly, the person with the highest rated talks here the past five years on the topic of the Oregon Cowlitz Trails is the curator of the Schmidt House Archives, Karen Johnson. So we have Dennis Larson and Karen Johnson. She also spoke recently at the Lacey Library, just uh, did a great job there with that same talk on the uh, Cowlitz Trail and the Oregon Trail. Uh, I tell you, you can't do better than these two knowledgeable and interesting historians, and to have them here at the same time just might bring this talk to near to the very top of the viewing list. I think it's going to be great. But uh, let's welcome Dennis Larson and Karen Johnson. Dennis? Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about Eddie's time here in Olympia and start off with his relationships with Native Americans in the area. Eddie really didn't have much experience back in Pittsburgh with Native Americans, but he got some experience with them coming out over the Oregon Trail, but more so when he started living here because his land that he, his donation land claim that he took up had been formerly occupied by Native Americans. Eddie had mixed feelings about the Indians. He respected their knowledge, the way they were able to live off the land, and their rights to the land. And he was really forward thinking when he assumed that the Native Americans actually owned this land and here were these white interlopers coming and taking it away from them. He also pitied the Indians because he knew um, that with all the influx of white settlers and technology and diseases that the Indians were doomed. Um, at their lifestyle, they were, were going to decline. It was just inevitable. So Eddie wrote, they are a friendly race, or long ago they would have resisted the encroachment of the settlers. Their lands have never yet been bought from them, and they are anxious to have a treaty ratified, securing them a reservation of some of their lands and security for future existence. To secure possession of our claim, we looked around for the original owner and found the old fellow who was the ostensible one, as he had been in the habit of making it his half year's residence with some four or five others for some time. Accordingly, I proceeded to buy out his interest in right and title, and to give it impress and dignity, we dressed ourselves in our best, summoned a council, selected our treaty ground under the biggest tree in the neighborhood, and after a silence of half an hour, succeeded by a big smoke, the conference opened in sonorous and guttural Chinook, eked out by expressive pantomime and energetic grunts, and after some time spent in stating the object of our meeting and arranging terms, a solemn treaty was concluded between us, the copy of which shall be sent to the archives of the Oregon Historical Society when we have one. Now, so here's two remarkable things. Eddie actually bought the land from an Indian that he assumed to be the owner. So that was, I mean, the government didn't do that. Um, and he also was willing to give a receipt to the Oregon Historical Society, which wasn't founded until 1898. And we've looked, and as far as we know, they do not have that treaty, darn it. <laughs> Eddie also had a chance to observe Indians and the skills that they had acquired over generations of living off the land here in the Pacific Northwest. One day, and you have to picture this scene as Eddie and his, uh, the roomies in the cabin were out cutting down trees on the donation of land claim. One day, when out cutting down trees, we thought we heard the echo of others chopping beyond us. We found an Indian, Indian cutting down a cedar. He ran and hid, but I told him to fear not, cut away. I thought it a hard case if they could not be allowed to cut enough timber to make a canoe on their own land. You, seemed, you see, it seemed a little hard because we had set up our lodge but a few weeks ago upon land that up to that date had been open for centuries to all Indians. He had selected as good a tree for his purpose as could be found. He was a week or 10 days finishing the canoe. He first stripped off the bark and then cut away the sap part of the tree, getting to the hard and tough part of the wood. Then, with no guide except his eye and with no tool except an old rasp he had sharpened, he fashioned a beautiful canoe about 15 feet long and a little over a foot wide of the most graceful shape imaginable. The greater part inside he burned out 
finishing it with his gauge. Then, making a huge torch of pitch fir, he scorched it all along until it was well charred and burned, all the time putting braces across, widening it gradually till it was two feet wide, beaming it with cedar, and after scouring it out well with rushes, it was finished, a model of grace, weighing 70 pounds and capable of carrying 800. Eddie also had occasion to write about a little uh, incident that happened with Michael T. Simmons, whom you all know. Riding down from Tumwater in company with Mike Simmons, the old settler before spoken of, I was startled by an emphatic exclamation and his quick dismounting and dashing into the bush. His quick eye had seen a squaw hanging from a low bush, evidently determined on self-destruction. Simmons cut her down, and I heard him talk some very strenuous Chinook, using some words that I had not known were in the vocabulary. He told me she was attempting suicide because of jealousy. Now, it seems a singular thing for me to say this, but I felt that life had more interest for the Indian women than I had supposed, and I was glad to know it. It was something more than the mere drudgery their lives seemed. I felt like taking off my cap in the unexpected presence of that divine instinct which God has implanted in woman that enables her to secure the consolation of love in seemingly impossible conditions. I was solicitous lest she would attempt suicide again after we passed on, but Simmons said she would not. And I apologize for the use of the word squaw. In, or Eddie did use some language that was common in that period, so I know that that word is not commonly used today. Uh, but we're trying to be, sh be true to the times that Eddie spoke of. Now, in 1853, which was a momentous year in, in Eddie's life and also in uh, Washington, the federal government created Washington Territory. At the same time, it appropriated $20,000, which would be a little over $600,000 in today's money. And that money was to build a military road from Puget Sound, Fort Stillicum, to Fort Walla Walla. Of course, besides handing military traffic, it would also allow Oregon, tri Oregon Trail pioneers to branch off from this end of the Oregon Trail. So instead of taking a path straight west from the Pendleton area and then the long way up to Stillicum and, and Olympia, they could if they wanted to and if they were induced to do so, take a little shortcut to Walla Walla and then take a, a direct line over the mountains to Puget Sound. The Sound residents heard that that $20,000 of government money wasn't going to be available right away. So they knew that if they wanted to entice that fall of 1853, if they wanted to entice travelers to come to Puget Sound, that they had to get started now on building a road. So they decided to finance it themselves. Eddie wrote, $20,000 wisely spent would make not a road worthy of the name, but at least a feasible, if difficult, way to get into the new territory and one within reach of the immigrants when they reached Walla Walla. So the settlers around South Puget Sound decided to take matters into their own hands and worry about the federal money later. A committee of five road viewers, or what we would call surveyors, uh, was elected, and Eddie was one of them. The settlers raised their own money through subscriptions and donations and got enough money to um, outfit this group of five road viewers to go across the mountains. So they chose the likeliest route, which was Natchez Pass, just north of Mount Rainier. And so the, the five men started across the mountains, uh, finding what they hoped would be an, an easy way, if there was an easy way to get across the mountains for uh, Oregon Trail settlers. Eddie wrote, where we entered the woods and began to descend gradually, uh, um, where we entered the woods and began to descend gradually, I looked at my little compass and found we were traveling due south. That was the wrong way. So he managed to get the, the surveyors back on the right path. Eddie's little compass is now actually in the collection of the University of Pittsburgh and Dennis has held it in his hands. The rest of that fascinating surveying and road building story is too long to go in here, but it's told in our book. Um, but at the end of that journey, Eddie and one of his cohorts came back to Olympia just a few days ahead of the, the rest of the uh, surveyor group. 
So here's what Eddie said about coming back home. At the outskirts of Olympia, and very extensive those outskirts are, we met a party of ladies and gentlemen going out to Judge Yantis's, dashed through them, scarce reining up to tell them the road could be made, hurried on, the sound of their cheers following on our heels. We pitched into Olympia, almost to the other end of which we had to go before we could check our excited horses. Such a commotion as our arrival kicked up in that extensive place. So after Eddie returned triumphantly to tell Olympia citizens that the road could be made and that they had found a decent route for it, and this was in July of 1853, Eddie took some time out and went, of course, back home to his cabin, only to find out that in his absence, his cabin had been robbed, despoiled, pillaged, and plundered. All the provisions were gone, along with his shirts and stockings, his razor, a knife that Brother William had given him, but the items that he really regretted losing were a heavy gold ring that was a gift, a Christmas gift from his sister Rebecca, and also a pair of gold sleeve buttons, or what we would call cufflinks, uh, that were a gift from Brother William. Eddie at first blamed the robbery on Indians, but then he later decided, if I really went on the hunt for the thieves, I would paddle down the sound and inquire what nomadic white men had passed through. In um, just a, a month or so later in that year, in, the, in August and September, Eddie returned with a, a bigger group of men to actually build the road across the mountains that he had surveyed. And they managed to, to do that. And when he got home in September, he again announced his triumphant return in Olympia and went home to his cabin, only to find out this time in his absence, his cabin and about $2,000 worth of cut timber had all burned. Um, and that $2,000 would have would be worth about $66,000 in today's money. So this was a lot of work that he and his roommates had gone to uh, and his cabin was burned. So he wrote home to his folks telling about the tragedy and he did consider it a tragedy. But he also in typical optimistic Eddie fashion wrote, my mental barometer however generally indicates fear. I thought of the great boon of health granted me, the life of free and unrestrained action before me, youth to achieve it, of you all at home, I shall rebuild my house again, and as soon as completed, I shall re reside in it. And indeed he did. So now, another part of that eventful year of 1853 was the arrival of a new governor, governor because this was a new, new territory and they needed a new governor. So Isaac Ingalls Stevens came out um, with a twofold purpose, well actually kind of threefold. He was going to be the new governor of the new Washington Territory. He was also mandated with surveying a railroad route across the northern United States. And he also came out to be an Indian agent. So he had quite a bit on his plate. When he arrived in Olympia in November of 1853, Eddie met him and Eddie wrote, he created a favorable impression on the instant. He is a small man, barely the average height, slender, spare, but he was well knit a world of endurance in his look, resolution, and will. He bore about him the impress of a man of mark. He is a very eloquent man and made a brilliant speech in relation to the glorious future destiny of Washington Territory. Well, Eddie continued having a relationship with Stevens. Within a week or so of, of Stevens' arrival, Eddie was meeting with him to talk about, actually promote that um, the road across the mountains. So Eddie called on him and, and wrote, he seemed much interested in the road and admired the public spirit which had determined first to find and then undertake building such a stupendous work as he flatteringly seemed to consider it. I took the liberty to represent to him that this road was a pet project of the people who had indeed called it the People's Road. That it had diverted the emigration from Oregon and given an impetus to the progress and prosperity of Washington Territory that nothing he could do at the introduction of his official career would be as universally acceptable or so commended by the people or make him so popular as his interesting himself in the road matter. And in fact, Eddie was able to get Stevens to write him a draft, a check we would call it, for over $1,300 to help pay for the expenses of the surveying and road building parties. Stevens also allowed Eddie to have access to the Territorial Library. And this was, I don't know if you've heard of this or not, but uh, when Stevens was first appointed governor, he was given a sum, I think it's $2,000, but don't quote me on that, to purchase a library of materials to start a new 
territorial library here in Olympia when he arrived. So Stevens bought all those books and other materials back east, had them shipped out around the Horn of South America, and they actually beat him here. So those books arrived first, and I think by the time Stevens arrived here, there were about 1,800 pieces in the um, territorial library, and most of that territorial library still exists in the state library. Is that true, Ralph? Sure. Yep. They used um, the boxes to make the bookshelves and so forth. Did all of you hear that? They used the, the shipping boxes to make bookshelves. Recycling at its finest. Uh, so one of the first things that Stevens did when he got out here was to have a territorial census taken because they needed to know how many people were around. And Eddie was part of that too, not part of the census taking process, but he, got, he made it onto the census. Um, in fact, I should, should preface this by saying that Eddie not only made it onto the census, but Eddie was part of creating, legally creating Washington Territory. When Eddie was first coming up the Cowlitz Trail from Portland, he made it all the way across the Oregon Trail, stayed for a while in the Portland area, and then headed north up the Cowlitz Trail. He got as far as Cowlitz Landing, which is today's Toledo, or within a few miles of today's Toledo. And there he was resting in a, a little cabin that passed as their wayside inn. And somebody came up and clapped him on the shoulder and said, Edward! And it was Quincy Brooks, his old friend from back home, who had come out the year before, as Dennis had mentioned. And so Quincy Brooks was on his way down to Monticello, which is today's Longview. Um, that area, and it's actually pronounced Monticello out here, even though back east, if you're talking about Thomas Jefferson, was pronounced Monticello, but out here they, they say Monticello. But at any rate, that's where Quincy Brooks was headed. He knew that Eddie was on his way out, and so he hoped to run into Eddie on the trail someplace and induce him to come to attend the Monticello Convention to help create Washington Territory. So luckily they ran into each other. So Eddie was part of creating the territory even before he actually took a precedence here. Um, but on the, um, as far as the census goes, Eddie wrote, the census man was puzzled at my frank confession of having no special trade or profession, and knowing me only in connection with the Cascade Road, put me down as a civil engineer. <laughs> Um, that earliest Washington Territory census has been lost to time. People have looked for it. People have not found it. Again, I'm correct, Ralph. It's, it's gone. But we have the totals that remain. So just to give you an idea of how many people were in the territory at that time, um, after the census was taken in late 1853, um, the total for the territory was 3,965 people. Now, who did that include? Whites, obviously, half-breed Indians, Negroes, mulattoes, Chinamen, and Kanakas, or their, the early term for Hawaiians. It, of course, did not include Native Americans, not full-blooded Native Americans. So there obviously were a lot more people in the territory than that. But they excluded um, full-breed Indians from the census. Of those nearly 4,000 people, just over 1,600 were eligible voters. Of course, in those days, that meant what? property owners, white men, yeah. Thurston County had a grand total of 996 residents, and Pierce County was smaller at that time. It only had 513. So these images in the back are not the census that I'm talking about. These are just some examples of early censuses. So during the winter of 1853-54, Eddie was roomies with some fairly important men. One of them was George McClellan, who went on to to become the commander of the Army of the Potomac during the Civil War, and he was also a presidential candidate in 1864. And George Gibbs, who had traveled west with uh, McClellan, he was a lawyer, but he came out here as an ethnologist who was going to study the Native Americans, a linguist, and also a geologist. So McClellan had, had come out west in advance of Governor Stevens, and his assigned duty was to find and build the road over the Cascade Mountains. Now McClellan, don't tell anybody this, but he was a lazy guy. <laughs> he didn't like hardships. Um, he had never worn snowshoes in his life, and he was not going to either. 
And in fact, he wrote his mother after he arrived out here, we have to pass the winter at Olympia on Puget Sound, a flourishing city of some 10 or 12 houses. Fine prospect that. I expect to spend the winter in a tent, labored by the rain and mud, for you must know that we don't expect to see the sun anymore until next summer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Except except at rare and short intervals of time. It is raining almost continuously. I don't think much of the Pacific Coast. It is vastly overrated in every respect. <laughs> now, as it turns out, McClellan, of course, did not have to spend the winter in a tent. He got to spend it in Eddie's cabin. Um, and while he was there, he was writing military reports for Governor Stevens and for the military back in Washington City, as Washington, D.C. was known then. And Eddie served as his secretary. And despite McClellan's distaste for the Northwest, Eddie found him to be a most amiable and engaging character. So he must have had some good points, besides not liking the rain. So George Gibbs also roomed in that cabin, which must have been rather crowded at times. Uh, during that winter, Gibbs compiled his now famous, uh, complete, fairly complete dictionary of the Chinook jargon, which was a blend of Indian words, English words, French words, or probably some few, a few other languages shown in, but primarily Indian, uh, English, and French. That <coughs> uh, dictionary that Gibbs compiled in Eddie's cabin is still the standard go-to dictionary for anyone starting studying the Chinook jargon. During this time and afterwards, Eddie compiled his own dictionary, and that still exists in the University of Pittsburgh archives, and as far as we know, it's never been published. So maybe Dennis and I will take that on someday. So Eddie, of course, not being a guy to sit around idly, besides all of his, the other things he accomplished in, 18, or in 1853, in December of that year, December, keep that in mind, he decided to go on a whaleboat voyage around Puget Sound. And he wrote home, when last I wrote you, I had returned from my four months arduous labors cutting the emigrant road through the Cascades Range and was busy on my claim, rebuilding my house, getting out more timber, thereby gradually clearing the land, watching the tide of events, taking a rest, ha, huh, and alternating between my claim and Olympia, fast increasing her limits and extending her suburbs. It had been my intention ever since I made my first home at Olympia to devote sufficient time for a complete exploration of the sound with its network of inlets, bays, coves, and surrounding country. I had chanced to come across Charles Weed, a high-minded, generous-hearted fellow who was going on the same expedition and requested me to accompany him. The vessel was the whaleboat Knickerbocker of pretty good capacity and sailing qualities, commanded by Charlie Smith, originally a Yankee sailor lad. They landed at my place one day, which was all the notice I had. I simply got, gathered up my blanket and embarked. So on this voyage in December, and you know what our Decembers are like, Eddie met some of the important pioneers down sound. John Swan, Charles Riley, Charles Terry, Doc Maynard, you might have heard of those folks in relation uh, to Seattle. Eddie also got to stop in and visit the baby communities of, of Alki, Seattle, uh, the Tacoma Narrows, Whidbey Island, Penn Cove, and also got to see and talked about an in abandoned Indian village with big longhouses, I mean huge longhouses, and even an Indian graveyard. So you can't have a small town of any size, especially not a territorial capital, and not get involved in politics and Eddie got involved here too. He was a proponent of the Free Soil Party, and that was a party that was devoted mainly to um, anti-slavery. They were abolitionists. And it was a short-lived party. It was primarily uh, active during the 1848 and 1852 presidential elections, but it lasted a little bit longer than that. Um, they particularly did not want slavery to extend to the western states and the western territories. The slogan was free soil, free speech, free labor, free men. So in November of 1853, Governor Stevens, who of course had just arrived, proclaimed January 30th of 1854 to be the election day for the new territorial legislature. Preparations for the election, according to Eddie, threw the hitherto calm and quiescent people into a high state of excitement, 
Party lines began to be strictly drawn. Caucuses and calls for conventions seemed to be the order of the day. Chancing to attend a sitting of the Whig Convention, which was another political party, I was called on to define my position, the doing of which would involve the achievement also of a speech. So Eddie got to make a speech, and he declared himself a Whig because he decided that it will be the Whigs who will save the country from the slavery propagandists. Eddie even got support from George McClellan, who told me that he had never voted. If he was anything, he said he was a Democrat, but he was going to vote for me. So the election was duly held after much speechifying and politicking and probably some stumping in those days, and Eddie came in fourth in the field of six candidates. So he got a goodly number of votes, but not enough to get him elected, and so his short-lived political career was over. So the, um, the one constant, I guess, in Eddie's life here in the Northwest, and the, most, the thing that he most looked forward to was getting mail from the states, as they called it. And he, he always uh, went frequently to Olympia to pick up mail, and one day he wrote, I came up this morning and dashing into the post office soon got my portion. Such a package. Five letters, all the current magazines, Harper's, Littell, Old Nick, with its familiar blue cover, lots of papers, cords of dispatches, essays on agriculture and essays on gardening. The postmaster grinned, said I would have to charter an extra boat to bring them over. Had barely time to glance over the letters and see you were all well, and ascertained even that much with great difficulty, as the lines soon began to run together and blur as I read, my eyes filling with tears. And he got emotional quite a bit. And another thing that came into Eddie's life, into the life of Northwest, was a, I guess I'll call it a fad, rather than a religion. But in 1848, in New York, uh, a family was visited by what they called manifestations, or ghosts, I guess we'd probably say, ghosts or spirits. Um, two young women in the house, teenagers, declared that they could visit with the spirit of a murdered man. And how did this murdered man com communicate? By rapping. So the girls would ask a question, and determining by the number of raps, they'd get like a yes or no answer. So. The, this story was widely publicized and spiritualism was born and became a fad all over the place. And of course it eventually, through uh, newspapers and travelers and whatnot, made its way out here to the West Coast. So Eddie described spiritualism. For some time back we have had rumors of manifestations being current in Portland and have been anxiously awaiting their coming here. But suppose the rainy season, severity of the weather, and the hardships of the pack trail have hitherto prevented their arrival. They came at last, however, and have spelled out some curious observations at Olympia. At the first meeting, the spirit of a ship captain, who had been lost overboard in his passage to San Francisco, was present and told the exact time of the accident, although no one in Olympia knew that time. When the vessel returned to port, an examination of, law, of the logbook showed the truth of that time. Well, how weird is that? Um, and he, continues, twice I went on board a schooner that lay in the bay, the captain of which was reported as being a medium. But though the captain was a very clever fellow, he could not procure us any manifestations. It was a curious sight, however, to see us all assembled there in his little cabin, crowding and grouped around the little table, all hushed, awed, and silent. In anxious expectancy, waiting for the faintest sound or sign, we sat there for over an hour, hearing no sound save our own breathing. And in our own little cabin, where we retired to later, we gathered around our table and tried it again, but the spirits never came. <laughs> so here's the earliest depiction of Olympia. And this was done in 1857, so this was a couple years after Eddie's time, but this is the earliest view we have of, of Olympia. No photographs earlier than this. This was done in, in 57 by James Alden, who was a military man and sketched quite a bit um, around the Northwest when he was here. So you'll have to bear with us because most of the photos we have shown here are of representative things that Eddie might have seen, other than the Eddie, uh, the Allen family photos and whatnot. Um, so in 1854, Eddie, for a reason that's a little bit unclear, asked his family to stop publishing 
his letters in the Pittsburgh paper. So we have very little information about what happened to Eddie in 1854. We finally hear from him for the last time from the Northwest anyway, in January of 1855, as he's getting ready to leave Olympia. He's made his home here for a little over two years, and he's going to return to Pittsburgh for good. He had allotted himself two years in the Northwest, and when that time was over, he was uh, ready to leave again with mixed feelings, and here he got emotional again. I sat for the last time upon the little stoop of my cabin, looking out over the calm waters of the bay, and remembering the evening nearly two years agone when I first floated over in my little canoe and took possession of the claim, which has ever since been home to me. A home so dear that I reproached myself as I almost imagined that the road to my old home led not into light but into shadow. Wondering what the fates had yet in store for me, whether my lines would ever tend hitherward again. The little space about my cabin had altered somewhat. The bright sun streamed in where aforetime the heavy cedars had cast shadows upon the ground. But out upon the broad bay all was unchanged, and the mellow golden light rested upon Rainier as gloriously as when upon the evening of the first day we leaned upon our axes and drank in the outlook before us. Half an hour afterwards, I was afloat in my little canoe, paddling slowly up to Olympia, a harassing time settling up my business, a goodbye to warm friends, and I was embarked upon the Halcyon, the ship, streaming down the sound, outward bound. Now, once the Halcyon um, got out onto the open ocean, uh, past the Olympic Peninsula, weather got a little rough. The gale increased, and the beauty and the grandeur of the scene died away in a sense of goneness at the pit of the stomach as I leaned over the rail. <laughs> but it, in, despite some other uh, bad experiences, mostly being seasick on the entire way down the coast, Eddie eventually arrived in San Francisco. He got his land legs back, he managed to attend an opera, and he walked around the city. San Francisco is a remarkably hospitable place. Although a stranger, I was 11 times in the kindest manner invited by young ladies to stop in and rest as I passed by. <laughs> and though impressed with their courtesy, I was constrained to refuse on the plea of the impropriety of making an evening call on so brief an acquaintance. <laughs> now, I wonder what those ladies were really up to. <laughs> So Eddie eventually left San Francisco aboard another steamboat, the Uncle Sam, which arrived on the Pacific coast of Central America, the Nicaragua area, and went overland across the isthmus to the, the Atlantic coast. And there he got on another steamship called the Prometheus, at least I think that's how you pronounce it, bound for New Orleans. When Dennis and I were doing all the research for this book, the information that we had at the time suggested that Eddie um, took another boat of unknown name up to New York from New Orleans, and then from there took the railroad back home to Pittsburgh, and that's how he finally arrived there. We've since found out that his brother William met him in New Orleans, and they managed to travel by, uh, by riverboat or steamboat up the rivers, so that's how he actually got home from his time in, um, in the Northwest. And it took him, from the time he left Olympia on the various boats in a little layover here and there in San Francisco, it took him about 56 days to get home to Pittsburgh. And on the way out in 1852, it took him five months plus. So it was quicker going back. So let me give you just a quick summary of, of Eddie's life. I'll, we're, boy, we're pushing our time here, so we're almost at the end here. Bear with me. Um, what did Eddie accomplish in his life after he made it back to Pittsburgh? He first went into the business of selling furnaces. And in 1857, he married Elizabeth Robinson, and they eventually had five children. He worked as a contractor on aqueducts and railroads, kind of following in his father's footsteps. And in that capacity, as a private contractor, he was captured by um, the Confederate Army at the start of the Civil War, but he was freed in a prisoner exchange. Um, he renewed his friendship with George McClellan, who by then was commander of the Union forces. And through that connection, Eddie got to meet uh, President Lincoln. And in fact, was given a commission by President Lincoln. He went on to recruit his own regiment, the 155th 
Pennsylvania Infantry, and he fought in several battles in the Civil War, including the battles of Fredericksburg and Gettysburg. Both of those battle sites have monuments, and both of those monuments have Eddie's name inscribed on them. So he was pretty well known, and he got to be a colonel. Um, after the war, he became an officer, in fact, a founding officer of the Pacific and Atlantic Telegraph Company, and that's how he made his bucks. And he became a pretty uh, well-to-do man. He was also a member of the prestigious South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club. And you might not have heard of that club, but has anybody here heard of the Johnstown Flood? Okay. That um, Johnstown flood, I won't go into the whole story here, but it was caused by the failure of a dam in Pennsylvania. And that dam was owned by the uh, hunting and fishing club that Eddie belonged to. Uh, the, the group was composed of about 50 very wealthy men. Eddie was one of them. And if you look at online and look at the list of the members, Eddie's last name, unfortunately, began with an A, so his name is the first on the list <laughs> of the owners. And he, he wrote later that he regretted um, that whole incident. Of course, it killed, what, like 2,200 people, I think? Something like that it was a terrible disaster of the time. Uh, but at any rate, Eddie returned to the Northwest at least twice in business trips, probably to, um, I would assume, deal with or have some real estate dealings, maybe getting rid of his land. He received an honorary degree from the Western University of Pennsylvania, and he continued writing. He wrote a couple of books, he wrote lyrics for songs, and of course he wrote a manuscript about his travels on the Oregon Trail and out here in Olympia. Now, this is, we gotta jump forward in time here for a minute and talk about some weird coincidences um, with this story of uh, research that Dennis and I embarked on several years ago. Um, this is a guy by the name of Gus Rosanio, and he lives in New Jersey. And in 1981, he was living in a little coastal town in New Jersey. And he was a young man then. And one day he was out walking to the beach, and he passed an old house owned by a lady who had recently died. And he noticed activity around the house, and obviously some people were clearing out the house for an estate sale. And they had put a bunch of uh, trash bags out on the curb waiting for the garbage man to come by. Well, Gus had done some dumpster diving, and so he decided he'd pick up a couple of those trash bags and take them home and see what was in them. So when he got home, besides some other interesting memorabilia, he found a packet of letters, all written on nice blue paper, all written by members of a family by the last name of Allen. All the letters were addressed to someone named Edward J. Allen in places like Portland and Olympia, Washington Territory. So over the next couple decades, um, Guy, or I'm sorry, um, Gus decided to really get into researching this family. And he spent most of his time research, researching some of the, um, the daughters who were involved with, with the Allen family. And he collected a lot of memorabilia, books, photos, other writings of the family. And then he finally decided to take an interest in Edward J. Allen, whoever this guy was. So in 2009, he decided to get on his computer and Google Edward J. Allen. And this is where serendipity comes in. Because the first thing up on his Google search was a story about some lady giving a talk in Olympia, Washington about somebody named Edward J. Allen. <laughs> Guess who that lady was? Um, so I had I was scheduled to give a talk over at the uh, the coach house behind the state capitol museum about Eddie, and so what serendipity? So here for the first time in well from 1981 to 2009, Gus had never done a Google search on Eddie, nor would he have probably found anything. But he did it at the right time. The coach house was nice enough to put an online notice about my talk, and Gus found me. He also found my phone number, and he called me, said, modestly said, and in a very understated fashion, as it turned out, I think I have some information about your Edward J. Allen. <laughs> <laughs> so D Dennis and I had the side of the correspondence that was published in the old Pittsburgh newspapers, the letters that Eddie had written to his family back home. Gus had the other side the letters that his family had written to Eddie. So for the first time in like 150 years, the two halves of that correspondence came together. So that was a phenomenal coincidence. But just to make it even more complete, uh, when we were doing our research, Dennis and I found an Allen descendant 
whose husband had been the guy to clean out that house in New Jersey. And so Dennis actually met him. They lived in Florida. Dennis and his wife went down there. And while talking to him, um, Dennis, or Dennis got Larry, this Larry Cahill, to tell the story about cleaning out that house. And Larry was heartbroken about it. He said, yes, it was his responsibility to clean out that house, which was owned by a, an Allen descendant. And he had hired some young people to help him. And he had set aside a couple trash bags, well, let's call them bags, with important documents that the family had saved for generations. And the young people who were helping mistakenly took those bags out to the trash, out to the curb. And he thought they were lost forever. And not only did they contain the letters, uh, but they also contained a letter signed by Abe Lincoln commissioning Eddie as a colonel. So Larry had just, for the, since 1981, had been heartbroken about losing these documents. But Dennis had the privilege of telling him, those letters still exist. So over, t over 25 years, and that all those things finally came together. And you have to write two bags. Yeah, well, yeah. But it, it kind of makes you think, what was in the rest of those bags? Huh? <laughs> anyway, to bring Eddie's life to a close, on December 26, 1915, Eddie passed away. And his wife, Elizabeth, who was apparently in good health, survived him by only five days. So I think theirs was truly a love story. Um, Eddie always wanted to write and publish a book about his travel over the Oregon Trail and his time here in Washington. He never achieved that, although he wrote a manuscript about it and obviously wrote a lot about it in, his, uh, in the contemporary times. Um, so Dennis and I, in writing our two books, hope that we have done justice to Eddie's writings, and we hope that you've enjoyed learning about Eddie here today. Thank you.